Hello and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, I want to continue my basic chemistry concepts. We're going to be talking about bonds, all kinds of bonds, why atoms form them, what kinds of bonds are possible, and some more good stuff. I want to make sure everybody watched part one. Did you watch part one? Part one was really about elements, the periodic table, understanding atomic structure, and why it's all about the electrons. If you haven't seen it or you're unfamiliar with those topics, check it out. Otherwise, this can be a little bit daunting, I know. It can make your, your head spin, or in my case, it can make your, your penguin spin. We're going to try and make some sense of it. Uh, we're going to look at why the noble gases are actually so happy. We looked at that before, but we're going to explore in this video how all the other atoms try and become as happy as the noble gases. The noble gases, if you recall, they are happy because their valence shells are full. That is to say, everyone is trying to attain this level of stability that the noble gases have all by themselves. So this is why they don't play well with others. But everybody else on the periodic table has to bond with other atoms to try to attain that level of stability. So unless you're a noble gas, the key to becoming happy is atomic bonding. And that's kind of where we left it last time, and this is the topic we're going to explore today. The key to happiness is a full valence shell, right? And of course, you want to feel just like a noble gas, even if you're not. So if you recall the periodic table and the valence electrons, it's pretty easy because all you have to do is look straight down in these groups or the columns and you see how many valence electrons a particular element will have. Um, that's going to make it a lot easier. So the periodic table is your friend, whether you want it to be or not. Uh, it's going to simplify your life. Trust me on this. We're going to look at different ways that atoms play together ionically, covalently, and we're going to look at hydrogen bonds. They're actually very important in biology because they hold a lot of really important stuff together. First bond we're going to look at is the ionic bond, taken, not shared. It's so dramatic. In ionic bonding, what's going to happen is one atom is going to donate one or more electrons. And when that happens, it's going to gain a positive charge. We're going to see why. Meanwhile, another atom is going to receive one or more electrons, and it's going to gain a negative charge. Now here's the key in chemistry, opposites attract. So it is the attractive force between the positively charged ion and the negatively charged ion that holds the whole thing together. That's the bond. So in their elemental state, that is when you look at the periodic table, the atoms are all neutral. Now if an atom loses electrons, one or more, it becomes an ion, which means that it has an electric charge. And specifically it becomes a cation, that is a positively charged ion. On the other hand, some atoms will gain one or more electrons. They also become ions, but they will gain a negative charge, and we use the term anion. Uh, to represent that. Um, if you've worked with batteries, of course, you're familiar with these cathodes, anodes, all the same thing. So the key is that these opposite charges attract each other. That's where the bond is. So let's look at the classic example of the ionic bond. You know, textbooks act as if there is only one example, but we'll look at it. Sodium and chlorine. You notice they're at opposite ends of the periodic table. What we've got here is a scenario where sodium, remember the electrons fill from the inside out, and it's got a valence shell of one electron, one lone electron. This is not a happy situation. Meanwhile, chlorine has seven valence electrons and would like to have eight. It would like to feel like a noble gas. So it is also very unhappy. But when sodium and chlorine get together, something really cool can happen. Sodium can lose that one electron. Look what happens now. Now it's second shell, this shell right here, is full. So sodium is happy. Meanwhile, chlorine gains an extra electron. It then has a full valence shell also, so it becomes happy. Everybody's happy. Now the thing is, don't forget though, that sodium now has one less electron than it has protons, while chlorine has one extra electron compared to the number of protons. That's where those charges come into play. So now you notice that this is not an atom anymore, it's an ion. It has a charge. Specifically, it's a cation. Chlorine is also an ion. Specifically, it's an anion. It is the attraction between these two opposite charges that holds sodium and chloride together. And you make salt. I know, it's just incredible how you make salt. It's so exciting. It's extremely stable because sodium and chloride really like to hang out together. 
Um, and you can see why. Opposites attract. If you look at another example, calcium chloride. Now, if you recall, this group has two valence electrons, and of course, chlorine still has seven. So you might already start to think, hmm, if calcium has two electrons in its valence shell and it could get rid of those, that would also make it stable and happy. So all you got to do in that case is bind with not one, but two chloride ions in order to achieve that stability. So calcium gives up its two outermost electrons, one to this chloride ion and one to this chloride ion. And the whole thing is held together in a very stable configuration. That's calcium chloride. So sometimes electrons are not taken, but rather shared. When that happens, we refer to the sharing of electrons as a covalent bond. But immediately you might start to think, you know, is sharing always equal? Well, in humans, certainly sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. The same thing is true for atoms. So sometimes the atoms exert equal pulls on the electron. And we refer to that kind of a bond as a nonpolar covalent bond. We'll see why in a little bit. Sometimes one atom has a stronger pull. It wants the electrons more than the other. So it kind of, the electrons will kind of play favorites because one atom is so much more desirable than another. How do you know who wants the electron more? How can you predict that? I mean, how would you ever know such a thing? Oh my God, it's on the periodic table. It turns out that as you go across from left to right, and as you go up, you have increasing electron affinity. That means how much any given atom wants electrons. They want electrons so badly the more you go towards this corner. Remember, excluding the noble gases because they're already happy already. So who's at the top right corner? Oh my gosh, it's fluorine. Fluorine is the most electron desiring atom in the whole periodic table. And if you know that, then this joke is actually funny. Okay, very geeky. So let's look at some covalent bonds. And we're going to look at the first one, hydrogen gas, which I actually showed you in the first video in my chemistry concept series. Hydrogen is the smallest atom. It has one electron in its valence shell would like to have two. So one thing that hydrogen can do is get together with another hydrogen atom and share its electrons. So each one shares the one electron that it has. This is a typical way that we draw it. And when you see this little line, this means one pair of electrons being shared. Okay, so that's what those lines mean. You're going to see that all over the place. Now, it turns out you can share more than one pair. So you can have a single, as we just saw, but also a double or even a triple bond. Oh, I love gelato. Don't you love gelato? This is a reason to go to Italy. If you go, make sure that you look for this word, artigianale, which means that it's actually handmade. If you're going to eat gelato, that's the only way to go. Sorry, back to covalent bonds. We're going to look at carbon dioxide. So carbon, you recall, has four electrons in its valence shell. Oxygen has six. So in order for this molecule to be stable, you need to share more than one pair of electrons between the carbon and each of the two oxygens. So this means that with these two lines right here, that represents two pairs of electrons being shared. And these two lines here represent two pairs of electrons being shared. And now if you count up all the electrons around each atom, everybody is happy. They all have eight electrons in their valence shell. What about oxygen gas? Oxygen has six electrons in its valence shell. So if two oxygen atoms come together, in order for them to have the full octet, they also need to form a double bond. And now if you count around, for each of the oxygens, this line represents two, this line represents two for four, then you have five, six, seven, eight. Same thing for this guy. So everybody's happy. Okay, let's look at one more. How about nitrogen gas? Now, nitrogen has five valence electrons. So for nitrogen to form covalent bonds with another nitrogen, they need to share three pairs. So two nitrogens will come together and form a triple bond. So covalent bonds represent sharing of electrons. And so far, all of this sharing that we have looked at is equal. These are nonpolar covalent bonds. What if the sharing is unequal? We've got to talk about this term polarity, and hopefully the term polarity makes you think about 
dualism or something where there are two sides that are that are different in biology if you think about mitosis and you know about the opposite poles of a cell as it prepares to divide um, that could help most people know about the poles on the globe of course we have the north pole with polar bears and we have the south pole with penguins on it that's that's a pretty good example now if you didn't know that and you thought there were penguins at the north pole don't feel bad. It's not your fault. It's because Hallmark puts penguins on the Christmas cards and with Santa. It drives me crazy. Okay, let's look at a situation where electrons are not shared equally, as in the case of hydrogen fluoride. Remember, fluorine wants electrons more than anybody else on the periodic table. So let's look at hydrogen and fluorine as they come together. Hydrogen has one valence electron. Fluorine, of course, has seven. And when they come together, so this is fluorine and this is hydrogen. And this diagram is supposed to represent the fact that fluorine has such a great pull on the electrons that the redder color represents the more negative side and the blue represents the more positive side of this thing. Now these are not electrical charges. This is not an ion. This is still a covalent bond, but it's polar. So it means that one side of the molecule is more negative, the other side of the molecule is more positive. So we call this a polar covalent bond. Another classic example of polar covalent bonds, water. Here's the oxygen, and these are the two hydrogens. And the oxygen exerts a much greater electron pull than the hydrogens. So the electrons prefer to hang out more on this end. So it makes this end, the oxygen end, slightly negative. The hydrogen end is slightly positive. And that's why water is polar. It turns out that hydrogen bonds are kind of related to this. Hydrogen bonds are weak interactions between slight negatives and slight positives. Even if it's slight, opposites still attract. And it's actually hydrogen bonds that account for all the amazing properties of water. The fact that water holds so much heat, it has a high vaporization, the fact that ice floats. I mean, you probably don't think about this too much unless you are a penguin, but it's something that other substances don't do, right? The solids are always more dense than the liquids. So this is all because of hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonds are actually really important. So let's look at water a little bit. You know, I, the more I look at it, I think water looks just like Mickey Mouse, doesn't it? I mean, maybe that's just me. I mean, if we orient the Mickey Mouse heads, wait a minute, sorry, squirrel. Okay, let's go back. Um, if you look at this, on the oxygen end, this end represents a slight negative end. This end, it's not shown here. This is slightly positive, but it's shown here. The slight negative and the slight positive, they attract each other. That, the dashed line, that's the hydrogen bond. And here's another one, and here's another one, here's another one. These are the hydrogen bonds between water that are so important and give rise to all of its amazing properties. Hydrogen bonds are important in other areas too. Um, hydrogen bonds actually hold DNA together. That might surprise you because they're actually fairly weak bonds, but it turns out that's really important because DNA has to unzip and open up in order to do all the things it needs to do. Hydrogen bonds also gives rise to a lot of the structural features we see in proteins like an alpha helix and a beta sheet. And in addition to that, oh my gosh, so much more. Enzymes bind to substrates because of hydrogen bonds, and antibodies bind to antigens because of hydrogen bonds, and it goes on and on and on. Hydrogen bonds turn out to be really important in biology, and you're going to see that as you continue in your studies. As always, I thank you for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. I hope this was helpful. Please support by clicking like, share, and subscribe. Join us on Facebook, follow on Twitter. Good luck.